The Big Sell Illuminati, where some of the best in the business discuss what's worked, what's working, and what's failed in selling big sales. Our panel of experts includes Clarity Seeker, a black belt of brands, our snarky marketer, Monique DeMeo. CEO to CEO selling is his game. Fortune 500 in his lane. The Lex Luthor of the clothes, Mark Kennedy. The effective executive, a force on the boards, a buyer on fire, Tiffany Olson. David versus Goliath selling, the prince of process, Sun Tzu of big sales strategy, Tom Searcy. And that's your panel. Now it's time to talk about big sales. All right. Welcome to the Big Sale Illuminati, uh, episode two. We're glad to have everybody here. We want to talk uh, during this episode about messaging. Now, we talked the last episode about messaging, but we want to talk about it again at a more granular level. Uh, something that really says, okay, how am I going to message, uh, not from a thought or theory perspective, but the real deal? Um, so, you know, that was episode one. And uh, we want to talk about the episode trends. And uh, we're also going to talk about the tactics. Okay. So, there's three real kind of points that we want to cover today, and I think that we can get through those. First is what's working and getting the first contact meeting. Love to hear from everybody about what that sounds like. The second thing we want to cover is what language is successful uh, when we're talking about revenue generation teams. When the teams are out there, what are they using to engage and keep engaged the people that they're working with? And then we'd like to get out there and find out what are the top pieces of information a sales team should know about the senior executive to whom they're sounding. And bottom line is we're talking about Cold War uh, intel, uh, and we need to have it uh, when we go uh, and get doing it. So I guess I'm going to kick off our first question, jump in on this one is, um, what is working that is really getting the first contact or first meeting? Uh, and you know, I'd like to hear your best, uh, best story on it. Uh, so whoever's uh, feeling like jumping in early, do we have a first mover? Yeah. I'll take the first mover advantage. So I recently got something in the mail and I thought that this was absolutely incredible. So it came in a package about this big and uh, I opened it up. I thought it was actually something that I had ordered on Amazon and I opened it up and it is a personalized video of this product. Now, um, what was incredible about this is one, it got my attention. Two, I watched the whole entire thing, which was about uh, three and a half minutes. Wow. And four, I'm going. It's an open house for um, a eye and face medi spa. So next time you'll see me, I'm going to look a lot nicer, <laughs> a lot younger. But it was so incredibly effective because it was very personalized. And I thought, what a great way, if you've got a big sale, to go out and customize something, this will get in the hands of the person that you want it to. And if it's personalized, they open it up. And I think it's much uh, more impressive than just an email with an embed embedded video. Well, I love that. I, I, I love that. I'm, I have something like that, but I mean, I'm telling you, I mean, Monique, what what makes that work better? I mean, you, you think about this stuff all the time. Yeah. I mean, when you said personalized, did they say your name in the video? They did not. This went out to, I'm sure, mass, mass mailings. Sure. But you could personalize it, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. No, it would be a lot, a lot more. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the point, in fact, is that as soon as you see, first of all, packaging, right? So there's a couple of things right now that sort of, I think, um, reversing, trend, trend reversal is that everyone looks forward to mail, which is <laughs> crazy to say, but it's true. Speci and precisely, and more specifically, professionally, because everyone's working from home. And professional mail is like, wow, that's so cool, as opposed to email, they're just done with it. Um, that shows not only thought, but cost. It's like a very premium, very like exclusive looking, feeling. They, took, they, they spent money on me, so maybe I'll just take a look at this. And it's different. So I think that's the, that was the, the the magic three there, you know. You know, one of the things I really like about that is it also comes in not as a, a gift, you know, old school, right? You used to be able to send somebody something that you know has a, a gift to it. But if you send that to someone who's, you know, C level suite or one right below them, and it comes in and uh, this does not look like you've sent them a golf club. 
uh, with a, you know, a Christmas card attached. Um, yeah. and that goes back to the years of pharma and, uh, and other world, uh, worlds like that. I got one like this, but it was a gift. Um, but it was somebody who wanted to up the level of the business that they were doing with us. And they sent a chest. All right. Like a wooden chest, like you'd get out of a, um, like a pirate chest. Yeah. Like a pirate <laughs> chest. Yeah. Thank you. And it had a bunch of stuff on the inside of it. That was really cool. Uh, you know, we, we call those bribes. No, it wasn't bribes. Uh, it was stuff on the inside, but it also had that video that you're talking about, except it was a personalized video. So somebody took the time and a decent amount of money to create that because then it's one-on-one, but you get to say a lot more about it. So did it work? Oh yeah. Yeah, of course. You know, are you gonna, somebody sends me something talking about me. I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> A gift and you. Yeah, right. Exactly. And I threw the gift away. I just kept the video. So <laughs> I think like the, you know, for us, the, the tactics of like, how do you get, how you wedge yourself into that first meeting? We, we do it a couple of different ways. And I've seen some, some, you know, it's, you definitely have to stand out in a unique way, but I think that the most effective way we use is we have a, and we've developed a network of referral partners and advisors over the years where we just go for the warm intros. And our job is basically to put out, you know, we, we have a very specific target when we go to market and sell. So we're going after, you know, Fortune 500 chief marketing officers, chief revenue officers, heads of performance marketing, those kind of roles. And it's kind of amazing when you can find their names on LinkedIn so you know who the target is. Uh, you know, they're also the ones that are doing the, you know, they're, they're getting interviewed by, you know, the, the, the analysts and whatnot about their revenue generation strategies, but we get, we get vetted by those trusted sources and that's by far the most effective warm way. I know it's not exciting. Like, you know, come up with coming up with this create, you know, create creative mailer or, or, you know, dimensional thing, but that works incredibly well for us. I probably 75% of the meetings that we take or that I get to take at the C-suite or are, are through that kind of a referral network. And we probably have, no more than a hundred people that are probably in that network that help us out. And I think that's one area where if you're going to spend, you know, especially as you get, you know, you get more mid career, like, you know, I'm in my early fifties and I, I know a million people from over the years and you just connect out with them. And, you know, those people, people want to help people. They want to be matchmakers. And I think that's one really strong dynamic of, of how to get a great appointment. Yeah. Mark, I, I, I would, I would totally agree with you because I think anytime someone who I know introduces me to someone, one, I feel a slight obligation to take oh, for that sure. and call it maybe more than slight. And right. two, it is that warm introduction. Um, I, I will say something creative uh, that, that uh, one of my folks did. We had been trying to get into Kaiser. <laughs> and for those of you that know healthcare, Kaiser is a huge healthcare system. Yep. And if you get a sale at Kaiser, you actually move market share. That's how big they are. You can move your share by 2 to 4% in the healthcare market. Huge. So we were trying to get in, and our account rep there could not, for the life of him, get in to see anybody. No one would see him. Everyone was blocking him. So what he did, he found out that they were having an off-site meeting at a hotel. Went to the hotel stayed in the men's room until, <laughs> until the CEO, the head of the lab at the time, walked into the men's room. And then voila, he just happened to be there. So he got the meeting with him and that's how he got it. And kind of a uh, different way to get introduced to somebody, but that um, casual meeting, whether it be at a conference, whether it be in a restroom, whether it be in a parking lot, um, also can, uh, can help. Yeah. So professional stock. I, I yeah. always thought it was incredible. Something I wouldn't have been able to do, but <laughs> it was well, clearly. Yeah, I, mean, I am very curious. I would love to know because that's just the way. What did he say? Like, Hey, <laughs> John, I don't know if he shook his hand or before not. Before or after, but that's not the question I was asking. <laughs> Seriously, that's got to be another book, right? Out of what's the best? Uh, what's the best opening line in a bathroom? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. I have a variety of them, but I would want to trim those down for publication. <laughs> uh, I think that maybe a little bit of professional editing and seeking out my attorney. 
<laughs> but I will tell you, we did end up getting the sale. It was a long process, but we did, and it was because of that first introduction. As a CEO, you'd have to you would have to respect somebody that went through the trouble to stalk you in the bathroom. Like if you could get past the latent creepiness of it all, you'd have to respect <laughs> the effort, right? Yeah. So I've seen different versions of this, by the way. Um, the restroom is kind of one of my favorite, although you're going to need to have a pitch that's about between 90 and, uh, uh, say, 360 seconds in length, or you're going to have to go ahead and lock the door. But uh, I like the idea. We had a guy that uh, was a lobby guy, right? He'd go sit in the lobby uh, and uh, he would do that on the the, the bigger deals. Uh, at one, it was a telecom company and he sat there. And it took him two days to figure out he was in the wrong lobby. Two days. And then he, then he had to go to another lobby. A huge deal. Fantastic opportunity for us. But, you know, the one thing that Mark was saying about the referrals is I would call that kind of that triangulation approach, right? So you identify uh, asking channel partners to introduce me to people that, you know, would be interesting gets you nothing. But if you say, I need you to introduce me to this one particular person at this one particular company, then your channel partner is going to be able to make the ask. And the, the other third part of that triangulation is do your damn homework. You have to have full profile on whoever it is that your channel partner is referring you into. You need to know about their business, their company, their industry, whatever, because you can't, you know, that's capital. When you're spending capital, when you ask somebody to introduce you to somebody, and if you miss, if you mishandle that capital, you don't get a chance to to, uh, to get to it or spend it twice. I, don't, I think people undervalue. I know I did earlier in my career undervalue the value of a good appointment. Like, how much? Do you, what do you guys think an appointment's worth in your world? Mm. What would you spend for a great appointment? Hmm. That's a good question. That's a very good question. I'd, I'd put it somewhere at ten thousand. Uh, yeah, ten thousand dollars. I mean, the, uh, I would to get a great appointment with someone who is semi qualified on my list of wh who I want to talk to. I could write a check for ten thousand dollars for that meeting because it would take me ten thousand dollars to get it. To, it. Hours, you know, opportunity cost, time inside and, and involved, and all the rest of it, and then knocking on the door and etc. Or Joe calls Sue and says, "I want you to talk to Tom." And, you know, and and Sue takes the phone call. She or, uh, is the head of or CEO or chairman of or whatever. Yeah. So 10 grand is 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 a very small amount. But most companies, I think what Mark, you're going to most pump companies go cheap. Their answer is, you know, uh, uh, just bang the phones and send the mail and and, you know, hope that you can get through. We did. Uh, I, you know, there actually is a place where the market where the market kind of speaks in that capacity. Have you guys ever, have you ever looked at charity buzz? No. <laughs> we have, a, I work with a guy who, um, I mean, he, I give him credit. He's determined as all get out, but he's one of his strategies for a while. And it worked. We got clients was he would buy executive meetings through charity buzz. And what they do is they'll basically say, I'm the CEO of Disney. And if you want to meet with me, if you'll donate, Five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars to, you know, the you know United Way or whatever is my favorite charity. You all you have to do is you do that, and you get into their admin, and bam, you're on their calendar, and uh, it, I, it works. I mean, we probably got four or five customers that way, and our cost of acquisition was nothing compared to the lifetime value of the accounts, and it works. It it it's a little dirty. I got to tell you, it doesn't feel great when you first do it. <laughs> Using poor, underprivileged children to get your yeah. meat. Yeah. You're paying for love, that's for sure, or at least Mark, attention. You have to pay in a dark alley in a trench coat. You do. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, one of them landed me in, I got, I, we bought dinner with the CEO of Publicis one year and had dinner on the top floor of the Publicis Tower. And uh, for like 10 people for, um, I think that one was like 25 grand or something. I don't know, but wow, it worked. Like it actually works. This will probably significantly increase. If we get any distribution, this will increase charity buzz. They should give us a kickback on that. Yeah, really? Sure. You. But you've asked a question. Uh, I mean, the, the driving question that you asked, I think is, uh, is what is the ratio between what we're spending now yeah. to get these amazing meetings that we all know are critical to moving forward on a big piece of business versus what we should be spending or uh, we should be valuing. And uh, I, I think that that's, uh, 
I think that's worth exploring. <clears throat> I've got clients that are looking for 25 high quality meetings in a year, and they're trying to uh, add 40 or $50 million to their business with sustainability over the course of three years. So now we're talking about relationships that are $100 million in size. And so you're not talking about, you can spend a decent chunk of money to go ahead and to add that, or you can just go ahead and yell at your salespeople to keep knocking on the door until somebody answers. And let me tell you which most folks take. So Mark, are you in, in favor of also more of the pay to play introductions where the, you know, the vendor will come to you and say, you know, I can make these warm introductions to you, to your top 25 target accounts, whatever it's an, and this is the co- your cost of acquisition. You're like, what are you going to do? What kind of outreach are you going to do? Oh my God. I've done those and uh, we've, you know, I've tried a lot. So Tom and I have a, a mutual, I've actually done a couple of different interesting ones. Um, you know, I, I view obviously Tom and what he does from a, um, a thought leadership perspective on sales as the preeminent in helping relatively small organizations sell to relatively gigantic ones. I mean, that's where Tom's, you know, the hunt big sales mantra over the years has been developed great. It, but it, what it's not really is it's not the how do I get in the door? I mean, there's messaging up front, but the actual ta- actual tactics of getting in the door, I feel like we're doing right now, maybe building his methodology for the front end of the process. But we'll we'll talk about building that. It. I'm stealing it wholesale. <laughs> All right, come on. <laughs> there are two different there are two different models I've tried and they're both they both have been effective, but not kind of the wildly effective. Nothing matches up right now for us, for our referral partner network. But the other tactics that we've done on that paid side where you go and contract with a group is um, uh, I don't, what's Keeveman's company called link strategies, link strategy. So not, don't be confused with LinkedIn. This is link strategies. And this is long form email content where they just blast executives and it worked like it paid for itself and returned a decent amount. It wasn't a home run. It was better at mid market than it was at the senior fortune 500 level, but that works. And, um, Great analytics. The team had really good execution. Once you get the messaging down right, it's a it's properly a machine, but it worked for us. Another one that I thought was really creative, and I forget the guy's company name now, but the the dude's name is Jay Jablonski, and um, I'm sure we could post it or whatever. But um, he's what I call the Tom Searcy, but of demand gen. And Jay has this crazy thing where what he does is he has all these offshore um, uh, surveyors. So they pound the phones. They'll literally make hundreds of thousands of phone calls on your behalf. And they'll call into a specific industry under the guise of just doing general market research on a specific topic. So you basically tee tee something up. You might say, what is the, um, you know, what are the, uh, what are the effects of blockchain and NFTs on loyalty programs? Like you're trying to create this next generation insight. So you have people calling into all these, you know, these retailers and whatever. And then what he does is he creates it. He gets enough data that he can publish the insights and then he'll call at the senior executive level in and say, and he'll, he has these great drips where basically he uses the old adage of curiosity killed the cat. And he'll say, Hey, your organization recently participated in a market wide survey around insights for this. Would you like to schedule a 30 minute call with the executive that sponsored the, the survey and you can see how your organization fares against your peers in this overall thing. And the pull through that rate for that is actually quite good. And you're starting with a, from a position of, you know, you're providing insights and, and it's a useful conversation and it's also contextualized. Yeah. So I like that one a lot. And um, I'm sure after if this thing goes live and Jace ever sees it, now he'll, he's on my network, so he'll see it. I'm sure this is going to cost me a contract this year again, but <laughs> but that stuff actually works. Um, that was a cool, that was one of the cool ones. One of the things that there's a consistent piece to this, and, and I don't know, I'd, I'd like to hear everybody's thoughts on this. All of them that we've discussed um, have these things in common. One of them, they, they position us as experts, either through what we just talked about, the Jablonski thing, or we talk about it at the, um, at the, the, the referral part. Someone is saying this particular person is bringing enough insight to the conversation that you should talk to them. Um, secondly, it, it's almost all pre-qualified around an industry segment. So, you know, you look at your, your contact base and you say, I know that that person is, you know, really, uh, in pharma, 
right? And so, so I, I'm going to go pick people that in pharma that I want. So that's another piece of that kind of closeness to the uh, to the other side of it. The third thing is, is traditional hammering the phones uh, to get to CEOs is possible, um, but the yield really deserves the question: Am I getting the yield um, on dollars and time? I think if the sales team is at the point where the only thing they're going to do is cold call CEOs, they've run out of good ideas. Yeah. There's really. got to be other better ways to do it. Those people, they're not sitting around waiting. I mean, we've done the, what's the, uh, the, the, the process you've got in terms of the voicemail strategy with leaving messages. What's that called? Building authority or. Are you talking about the six step process for prospecting? Yeah. that's uh, it. Yeah. Um, we start off with the, the, with the outreach call with the intention of not getting anybody to answer it. Yeah. And then doing, and then doing the follow up afterwards. You build trust through voicemail, which is, a, I mean, there's there's a degree of desperation. That's not, that's not the first three steps of it. You're talking about the <laughs> last three steps, steps of it. The first three steps of it build something else. Listen, Kennedy's got a good idea, all right, but a bad impression, all right? <laughs> so. Might have been the execution. Yeah, it might have been the execution. Frequency does build trust to some extent and trust or builds familiarity and familiarity builds trust. So the idea of multi-touch, right? This guy, this girl, whatever, is really very persistent in trying to reach me, us, our team, fill in the blank. So there's some, there's value to that. The, I mean, the other thing that people underestimate is literally call when everybody else isn't. Like when you, when they zag, you got a zig or when they zig, you got a zag. Like yeah. if everybody's doing email, do something else. If everybody's, you know, call. And oh, by the way, don't call on a Tuesday at 11, call on a Monday at 730. I mean, how difficult is that? Yeah. Hit, hit them where they ain't, right? To, right. to go back to the, the baseball model on that one. Hey, one, one other thing I'd, I'd add to the, um, just as a, as kind of a crazy uh, anecdote to the, the Kievman outreach. So we pretty much spent, we hit the globe. I mean, email after email after email. And we got a response from Elon Musk to one of our email outreaches. And it was, and we were talking to him about, you know, we were going after him in terms of helping um, improve his online reputation management. <laughs> Good luck with that, babe. <laughs> so he replies back. It was the best email. He said, fellas, he says, um, my Wikipedia page is a war zone and I like it that way. Let the chips fall where they may. All the best, Elon. <laughs> <laughs> you should frame that thing. I've you got it. It's absolutely it. fantastic. That is I'm fantastic. Like, son of a gun. Email gets through. Yeah. How many emails did you send before he responded to that one? Oh gosh, it's hard to say. I, I, I can't even tell you that. I, I don't know. It wasn't us personally. That was that was a campaign that we went through that link strategies group. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, lo I love that, though, because, you know, his answer is, you know, the P.T. Barnum, there's no such thing as bad press or whoever it was. Yeah, exactly. That said it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All there is is press. Uh, <laughs> let, let, let's close out this particular part before we move on. Um, Tiffany, you talked about kind of the more retail part where you got the the uh, uh, the part um, uh, for the spa, uh, et cetera, which I thought I think is brilliant, by the way. I, I love it. Um but that's more at a retail level. You kind of, at, you know, you've been at the senior executive, you've been, you're on the board, people are reaching out to you. Is there anything that's cutting through uh, that we should know that, that, uh, that you see? So I do think that this can be used for not, you know, consumer to consumer, but it can be used to get appointments with um, uh, senior levels. But again, Tom, you got to do your homework. You know, the, the what you've been saying, you've got to have, the message on here so that somebody wants to have that next meeting. But I think that that is really effective. I think that that piece is, you know, I, I hope people steal that idea uh, and figure out a way to use it. And then don't send me all of the videos that are coming. Although, cause I'll watch videos. Um, but I would say that um, that idea of creating the material without creating some people send this stuff out believing that they're going to sell their business or sell their, their approach to what they're going to get and et cetera. The purpose of this is to secure a meeting. So provide enough inside information, intrigue to get someone to take uh, the meeting, but don't try and use it to sell and close 
inside of this. When we work with salespeople, a lot of the time, that's the first thing is they're like, I got to go ahead and get this deal. And your answer is no, you have to have a, a meeting to then start the conversation. And everything we've been talking about right now is how do I spend and, and intelligently invest in getting meetings? Yeah. So I want to talk about the language. All right. Remember we talked about the language the last time that we were here, we were talking about the language, but you know, there's the language that gets you to uh, get engaged. And then there's the language that gets you to sustain um, a relationship uh, with an executive buyer. I'm going to jump in on this one up front. If you ain't talking about money, you ain't talking about nothing. When I talk to senior executives anywhere, I start off with the idea of money um, at CEO, C, fill in the blank at the C level. And oftentimes it starts off with slide number one. Let's talk about the money. And then we go through in a very rapid fashion, what is uh, the money as a relationship inside that first meeting. And the language is all about their language of money, whether it's cost per transaction, cost per what we're talking about right now, cost uh, per free, uh, first meeting. Uh, what is the, you know, in the credit card business, what's the cost of transfer of, uh, of balance? And you kind of go through that. Well, you have to be re uh, researched. But the issue there is, is I want that conversation because as long as I'm talking about money, I am talking to a language that they're going to be more curious about and it's going to sustain. Obviously, the money inside of their business and it relates inside of their marketplace. But um, so start there and then move backwards. Lots of people start off with the first conversation about the history of their company and how they got formed, mission, vision, values. People I'm talking about, they don't care. They want to hear about that after they've decided that you've got something interesting to say. Yeah, the, the language that lands has to be very precise and it has to be super contextualized. I think, you know, your your entry stakes, we're not talking about in the meeting yet. We're talking about the language that lands a meeting. Is that where you're is that where you're landing here right now? Actually, I'm I'm talking about the bridge. So it comes because it comes in on the first call is what's going to penetrate the conversation and get you in the meeting. When yeah. you get the meeting, you have to extend it, uh, expand it and make it uh, more robust, robust and more uh, particular. Um, to it. So I got to get the door open to be able to have the conversation that we really want to have. I think for, I agree completely on the money. Um, you know, the, the research for that to get to the point where you can talk about it is, you know, endemic to all the annual report information, all the publicly available stuff for the public companies. I mean, that's the table stakes to be able to be contextual. I, I think for me personally, the, the language that has hit home with, senior executives is being provocative to the point of almost being um, being arrogant or irritating. So I've used terms like bags of money. I'm coming here with bags of money. Um, you know, I've, I've used terms. I've used a, I actually closed a deal with a, you know, a fortune 50 company where I, we put together a business case. It was incredibly compelling. It was, it was literally, you give me a dollar, I'll give you $10 a month for the next ever. And, um, and then the guy went silent on me and I sent him a note back and I said, listen, man, I said, when I put a deal together like this and I bring you bags of money, I expect a check and not a brush off what's going on. And literally I had a PO in three days. So, I mean, you have to stand your ground when you know where you're, where you stand. I, I just, I think, I, I think people are so, I think people are so, concerned or they get so um, intimidated by the position of some of these folks that they don't, they, they, they don't, they realize that, that they're uh, they're an equal participant in that game. And I, I just think folks lose sight of that. Tom has been very helpful in those areas over the years, but I, I think as provocative as you can be with those folks um, that, that that's always, that's worked well, really well for us in the, you know, in the current type of deal we're doing. Well, I, if I may add one thing, the one, the one thing is we can't, I think it's a distinction with a difference, and that is it really does depend on the person's function and role within the company. You're not going to use the same terminology with a senior marketing leader that you're going to use with like a compliance or a legal or a CFO. I mean, I, I hate to bring it back to, oh, the marketing girl's talking about personas, but we're going to talk about personas because they work. Uh, you know, is you can't you you can't talk widgets to the person who's talking you know strategy or ROI or whatever. And I I wrote down some some words that I think sex, from a segmentation perspective work as part of that 
And I agree with you, Mark, being a little, it's almost to the point of cocky because you're standing your ground and you're confident in your solution and you're willing to be that guy to say, I really got what you need. Now, if you're going to be an idiot and not take the meeting, that's fine, but I really got it. So I think, um, you know, sales leaders are going to resonate with the deal size, the margin, the, the customer retention, the marketing leaders are going to talk about leads, conversions, ROIs, the stuff that they're on the hook for. And now they're in, on the hook for, for pipeline. They're on the hook for pipeline and they're getting compensated on pipeline. So they have a vested interest in, in seeing that through. And then the, you know, obviously the financial leaders are going to be ROI margin. The one thing I'm seeing more of, especially in regulated industries is the fear with compliance compliance and regulatory man that is a button we are pushing heavy right now yeah it's this idea that we can help you stay out of jail is probably a little compelling especially what's going on right now (laughs) i think too um monique especially with the senior leaders in an organization it's about risk managing the risk so if there's a way not only compliance risk but risk within the supply chain um other types of risks and i absolutely agree that um customizing that message to what that person's goals are. Right. And that takes just knowledge. Um, even if you can't get down to their specific goals, just normally uh, whatever role they play, they are going to be very um, kind of general type of goals that most people in that type of a position have. So being able to hit on those is extremely important. But the risk, the risk around reporting compliance, um, the risk of uh, needing transparency within the supply chain, all of those types of things really uh, resonate. Yeah. And now you can wrap ESG around that because that's going to, that's a whole other wrapper that they're struggling with. So you know, we've had a couple of pieces that are in this conversation. I want to, I just want to tease out. And that is, is that we're asking and believing that our sales professionals and executives and, and the folks that are participating in this are more confident. Mm-hmm. You know, they're just leaning in more directly. So they, to do that, they have to be better. Um, they have to better be better researched when they do that. They have to shape their message um, aggressively, but not offensively. So, and then they have to be contextually right now. Compliance is big. There's a huge hospital system. They just wrote a check for $220 million for, uh, you know, uh, just a payout for, and there's lots of industries that are getting fined or paying out. And the minute you get a fine in anywhere, the compliance monsters go ahead and, you know, flying purple monkeys come in there and they just, they cover the plane of all decisions that are going to be made. So that's one of the things I would say. And I'm going to go and second thing I want to say is, is that, you know, I've been pitched by Monique. Okay. And Monique, yeah. What, how the hell do you think you got your deal? Okay. So anyway, all right. And she is aggressive and direct. You know, she said in the sales call, her answer, you know, we've gone talking with goes, Whoa, hold on a second. Okay. Let's just start with the idea that yield is all you care about. Dollar is in, dollar is out, and everything else you've tried doesn't work. So let's just agree that everything else that's on the list, this is not on that list. She had my full attention um, because... You did. Uh, don't tell everybody. You did I have that no one. recollection of any of this, but go ahead. Well, okay. When they changed up your meds, that's what happens. All right. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, you know, and so it's not my fault, but I do have a recording of that meeting. Anyway, the point, the point being is, is we talk about that provocative point. Uh, Tiffany talks about the point of being provocative around compliance saying, look, if you're not in compliance, let me give you a list of what it costs you. So her issue is, compliance as the driver. Your issue is stick to the issue of what's mattering. And I'm going to, I'm going to cut away all the other crap that you hear from everybody else. And I'm going to drive to uh, to the single issue. Mark's uh, point is being provocative and saying the kinds of things that grab attention that don't sound like 20 other um, salespeople out there that, that you hear. So I'm, I'm hearing some thematic pieces that if you're an executive sales professional out there trying to, to sell in the mid market and beyond. These are some core language guidelines. I want to ask a, a question though, among, among us, do we really think that most of the salespeople that are doing selling out there right now have the skills and the ability to pull off what we're just talking about? Only the best. I don't, I don't. 
only the best ones are. Only the best ones are. And I'm, I'm not saying that to be smug. I'm simply saying, no, I know. Um, because if everybody was great at it, I wouldn't have a business. So I like that. So I uh, no, I I think. What, what do you think the percentage would be, Mark? You, just from your perspective, as far as who can do it? Well, it's super small. I mean, if it, the answer is it depends, right? So it depends on it depends on the level that is the target. So if your target is the C-suite of Fortune 500 companies. You're talking one tenth of one percent of all salespeople have the ability to get in there and hang. But if you're talking about you know somebody that's selling a, a you know a, a basic program at the director or manager level, you know I think you know half half or a quarter of the uh, of the field can play in that game. I just think it's very different. What I what my experience is as I've gone up in organizations. So I've I've worked in organiz- I've worked in companies that sold at the director level of IT for implementation services. I've sold at the, you know, a whole way up and down. Right now, I'm at, at the highest I've ever been where I'm selling to the, the CEO and the chief marketing officer. And what I've found is in order to bring the rest of the team along, it's establish executive sponsorship because executive intent is everything in big organizations in terms of where they're going to go. You can't lead a big organization. What you can do is align with their intents and their objectives. So, We, I establish and work with the team to really hard to establish that. And then I hand the process off and they run the business case development. And our business case development is it's alignment with compliance. It defines the outcomes. It ensures implementation. It creates confidence in, uh, in client success. It gives us insights that a lot of allows us to project and forecast the overall impacts that bring the business case back. So the team that runs that, and while they're running that, our sales team that runs it are learning all the way about the relationships and the checkpoints, the controls in the organization, all those, you know, all the things that are required to get to that endpoint. So that lets a bigger team play Mm -hmm. as opposed to it just being, you know, one person that can go in and, and kind of singularly do something because big companies are going to do that. I mean, they're, they're looking for a partner. Big, big likes to buy from big. And if you can't match up your resources, your, your subject matter expertise, your compliance expertise, your legal expertise, you know, your technical experts with their folks, their project management experts, their account people, yeah. all those have to match up. And I, I think that's where the nuance is in terms of what percentage of people can really play that game. The answer, I think, at the C-suite is super small, but you can leverage them with a bunch of younger people, for lack of a better term, less experienced people that can do the work. I think that's the breakdown of the process. We have that sh- uh, that sharp pointy end of the, of the spear to get into that executive sponsor, that C-suite place, lays out the expectation of how that development's going to go. And because Mark's talking about that idea of forming a match-to-match uh, process to go ahead and build the business case out, establish the contacts and credibility, and, and move that along. Uh, but everybody has to know what they're going to do. So I, I, I really like the point Mark's making, which is I only need a couple of people to create that opportunity, but I need a team to continue to drive it along and to and to sell it. And uh, and so it's just yeah. So your point. How many people can do that? Well, you don't need an infinite amount. You need a small amount if you're going to get in, but then you've got this other people. And they've got to, I mean, they can't show up and just like not know anything. <laughs> they have to be smart as well um, about that. I think one thing else too, Tom, when you talk about like the language that lands and the tactics that gain engagement on the executive side, the the people that certainly I sell to are some of the most competitive people in the world Hmm. you can't get there without being that way so one of the things that we do a lot of is we show them insights in terms of how they rank versus their competitors right as well as both at the company level and how their brand performs but also individually like here's what like here's what here's what google thinks about you and here's how you rank against other executives and it drives them wild (laughs) Because, I mean, there are deficiencies everywhere. I mean, there's, you know, there are very few folks that are at the, you know, the, you know, if you want the gold standard of, you know, brand stuff, you know, you got your Coke executives, you've got uh, Coca-Cola ex- executives. I mean, those are the folks that are the brand, the brand. your Procter & Gamble folks. I mean, I think they just vanish if they do something bad. But um, but most folks are, you know, they're, they're, there can be the scratch and dent table to get to where they got. And uh, there's a lot of really good information. But 
in appealing to that that native competitiveness has has been a great way to get them to you know to to move to action. I want to bridge over. Uh, this is one of those areas where I mean we're talking about a lot of great stuff. We're talking about messaging to get in the door. We're talking about how we sustain that messaging. We're talking about the process. But I want to ask Tiffany a question. Um, what's the best person recently or in the near past who's done the homework to know you? I mean, truly mm-hmm. to the point where you feel like, you know, are you tapping my phone? I mean, uh, you know, I mean, because I'll tell you that that ability to say, I understand your shoes and to have that language or reference is, is, is you know, you know, we're alike. So I have a higher level of trust. Who, who's the, the best circumstance where someone has reached out to you in a way that uh, that was relevant or valid, valuable? So I, I would say that it was from, um, and we had talked about this earlier, but from someone who was introduced to me from someone else. So they had already done their research on um, what they needed, had gotten, you know, looked at all my social information, my LinkedIn, so really knew what I was um, uh, kind of personally about but then also the specifics on the company. So what for the company, what were we really trying to do? And then from that warm introduction, married those two right away. And then it was kind of the instant trust. So it was the, hey, you know, you went to the University of Minnesota. I went there or, you know, a friend of mine went there or I visited up there, you know, something that right away kind of in the initial kind of chit chat, you're able to grab some type of commonality. Um, that, it, it, for me, that like bonds this kind of trust right away, um, which then allows my guard to come down and listen more to uh, to what's being said. And it, it, especially if it hits one of the things or one of the areas that I've got a goal for, uh, for that year, um, then that really piques my, uh, piques my interest, but it's really about, um, someone who, uh, can right away increase that trust and lower my guard and then go in on the business side. Okay. Monique, what's your shot at that? You know, it's so boring. It's, it, that's exactly what it is. It's like, I, I got a, I, I get a, a bunch of different solicitations every day. And the one that I got, I have to talk about the negative before I can talk about the positive. And it was, yo, Monique. I was like, excuse me? <laughs> was, it from, was it from Kanye? Hold on a second. Did you just yo me and you want my business? All right, let me get that straight. Literally, yo, Monique. And then snarky follow-up email number two within three days. Hey, what's up? You're not answering my email. I don't even know what your company does. How about you spend a couple of calories telling me that before you yo me? <laughs> so I was like, wait a minute. So I, I said, I can't. Oh, so I, I was like, okay, that's it. I cannot go on without addressing your email and giving you some feedback because I'm too senior and too tired of getting these types of emails. This is what you're doing wrong. Do not ever yo a senior person. And I literally went and I spent 10 minutes on this freaking email, 10 points of what you should never do. Sent it back. I got this. Thanks so much for the feedback. That was great. Ding. You should you should put take those ten if you've got them, and we'll put them in the show notes. Uh, if, if so, if you've got the ten points, take that email. You can scrub it if you want. But I, I you know, when you're on those Zoom calls where you've got like your your name and whatever on the on there, I want to have Monique, and then say you know in quotes Yo Monique, and so people <laughs> just understand that that's what they're supposed to call you when they're on on a uh, on a call. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, I'm not a very, I'm not, when I look at uh, conversations, I'm not great. Uh, like Tiffany is what she truly is about connecting and all the rest of that kind of stuff, uh, on a personal level, which is not, um, and explains why I have two new clients in the last four years. No, I, I, that's my, thank you for the laugh, except for Monique who's sitting there going, what? <laughs> that's not my, it, my specialty is to, to look at their background and look at the route, uh, their reference frame. And this is kind of like what Tiffany says. I want to understand your career. 
how long were you in any one given position? How long did it take for you to advance up? Did you have to go laterally to go up as far as into another company or whatever? So I want to be able to talk about things like, hey, I looked at the, your background here. I see you were at this place. You're only there nine months and then you got promoted. That usually is caused by an event. What got you to the next level? And I come from that level of curiosity of doing my background intel, um, you know, and, you know, because, you know, I, my ability to reach out and talk about things like sports or uh, about university backgrounds, uh, you know, Minnesota or, or some a bigger university or whatever, don't have it. So I have to use their, their CV as my point of connection. Um, and it's not directly. Uh, so Mark looks like he wanted to jump in on something there. No, actually, I, I looked at I look at that as well in terms of the pivot points in their career. And you really have, you know, if you're going to make some broad based judgments, there's a you have like a handful of different career trajectories that folks typically have. You've got your because I am I'm very much not an A student and I have a very atypical career. And um, I can also tie in the last one for just a second, which I have to give it. I, had, I do have to give a shout out to Oracle Sales. They had they were trying to sell me an ERP system for my company, and this poor girl had been sell had been sending me a million emails, nothing returned, no phone calls returned. I don't want it, but she did finally send me a box that had a baseball, a wooden baseball bat in it, and said, "Harkening like back to your old days of baseball at Bucknell, we thought you might you know use this bat to whatever." And I'm like, "Wow, that was pretty creative." So I took the phone call and I said. I think it's great. As a salesperson, you did a great job. If you ever want a job, I'll hire you. But I am not, I don't need it, nor do I want an ERP system from Oracle or anybody else. (laughs) I've got all the ERP I can handle. So I thought that was cute. That's very cute. Yeah. And very personal. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You you know, uh, one of the things I think too, Tom, just when you were talking, I think that the world, especially the younger people coming into the workforce, the way that people are switching jobs, switching careers, taking time off. I think that that will be, um, you know, when I fast forward, when they're more in the senior levels, those type of conversations that you had, I, I think the framing will have to be a little bit different because it won't be quite such a clear path or maybe a milestone, but more a, you know, personal life experience yeah, they, it's like not linear anymore. It's more portfolio. They call it portfolio. There's a great book called It Flux, Eight Superpowers to Develop in a Changing World by April Rennie. She's an amazing person, by the way, little shameless plug. But that's what, you, what you're describing, Tiffany, is like the portfolio career. And that's how they think. They compartmentalize different experiences to con- consolidate the oneness, whereas we were like the one at a time. <laughs> you know, it's yes. weird. Yeah, this keeps coming back to this point that I, I like so much, and that is focused selling, right? Focus reach, reach, rather than scattergun reach. So um, the Bucknell baseball bat. Well, they had to understand that they were reaching out to you specifically about a specific issue, right? And when you're when you're doing this very, um, oftentimes in my background and maybe your background. The encouragement was a much broader um, uh, reach out to go ahead and talk to people. And I think that that right now is there's so much reach out there of people trying to do that. You've got to bring it in tighter, whether it's a really highly refined message like Monique uses. Right. And uh, very, very clear inside of an industry segment or whatever. Or you've got something like. Uh, what Mark does and uh, gets into very tight pieces, the kind of successful things that gets into Tiffany's um, places. It's that it's picking them off, high targeting, picking them off. And I would only offer one thing. We're the big sale Illuminati, which for us really means what are the people we touch and who kind of touch at us? Well, these are people that make decisions that are, you know, anywhere from, you know, uh, middle six to, uh, high eight, uh, uh, this digit kinds of buys, they're not going to necessarily respond. Um, if you don't have that level of issue to resolve, but 
they they're looking. Uh, and so if you send to you know, somebody at a C- CEO level or whatever, a standard email, yo um, right. That, or that See, I think you didn't put that, but yo Monique is different than yo Monique. Very different. I think right now you would have gotten a better different phrase if you gone ahead and put the, uh, you know, the accent, the accent on the wrong syllable. Yeah, the emphasis was wrong. It's I, I think it would work otherwise. Yeah, it's the energy. <laughs> hey, you know, that's a that's a great point you, you you hit there, Tom, which is a lot of you talk about being like big sale Illuminati. The what I'm seeing now a lot of is one of the challenges is it's not so much does your solution work. It's are you impactful enough to move the needle at the level of the office that you're talking to? I was we we were working with a, a major tier one credit card originator and you know, their take is I need, you know, I need a million new cards originated a year. Wow. And if you're not in that level of scale, you're not going to move the needle for me and you're going to start to head down market or into a different office of my company. So the the big numbers are, you know, if you're, if you're really going to play in the, you know, the top of the organizations where stuff happens fast, your solution needs to be, I mean, it needs to be market moving. And I, that certainly is for me is in, in playing in this realm of, you know, the eight figure deals that we're doing. Those are the those are the impactful things where you're like you have to be thinking at a level of scale and a level of consistency and and you know all the other the compliance stuff too. It has to be there to, to enable it and to have it sustain. But the impact has got to be it has to be market moving. Yeah, but Tiffany, when people are talking to you, I would assume they're getting to you or the board with something that is market moving and typically has a purchase price that they're asking for approval uh, for something. Are you seeing any of these market moving ideas getting to the board uh, board level or are they getting stuck pre board too many other things to focus on? Um, What kinds of things are you seeing in, in that purchase chain? I think as far as things seeing um, and coming up, uh, the uh, hot buttons, the ESG, the supply chain sustainability, compliance, um, regulatory type of um, tracking, um, those types of things are what really get the attention. Um, And I think to Mark's standpoint of benchmarking, so data on here's where the industry is, you know, the size of company that you have on um, environmental standards, um, on, you know, gas house admissions. So those types of things really resonate well. So it's very kind of topic driven. Um, and, I, I, you know, for me, it's a lot of meeting people at conferences that I might not know. Um, that have something or come up to me and it's that first, you know, 60 seconds that uh, my mind will say, yep, maybe maybe this is something that I'm interested in pursuing or not. I see. I think that's really interesting because what you're talking about is boards are looking visionary and long as, as long as revenue plans are being reached, right, then they don't reach the board level. It's only when we have a revenue or market share things fall off at at some level. It doesn't get to the board. Board looked at the annual plan. Board looked at all the rest of that stuff. What's the forward looking things? So I'm hearing board level things around um, that. I'm hearing potentially further down the executive chain. As long as you're not making a mistake, you're not talking to the board. And if you, some of those folks, if you're talking to the board, you're in a room you don't want to be in, you know, the board doesn't say, come into this room. What we want to do is a lot of hugs and some flowers and some candles and just celebrate. No. No, if you're if you're not hitting those numbers, they're kind of they're kind of look they show up with HR and say, Did you bring your things in a box? All right, well we're we're at time. Uh, this is time for shameless plugs. Um, I'm gonna lead off with a shameless plug. I've just finished a book called uh, Be Your Future Self Now. Um, and it, it's a good book as far as just a methodology piece for you designing. Uh, and, and we've all done different books. I just think that uh, Dr. Benjamin Hardy does a good job in that book. And, it was awesome, wasn't it? I liked him. And, I heard him on a podcast. He's really good. Yeah, he's good. So that's my shameless plug is for his book, 
Who else has got a, a shameless? It can be about your company or anybody, anything else that you like to. Or if you feel like uh, doing a shameless plug for my company, I'm fine with that too. <laughs> there you go. No other shameless plugs this time? I got one. I came across a cool company this week. Um, it, it's called Bamboo Meta. And it's a blockchain and NFT company that has figured out a way to solve the loyalty card and loyalty program for most big retailers. Super interesting technology, nice. super quick time to implementation, very interesting approach to solving a number of challenging problems with how to activate your uh, your loyalty programs and to do it through the Apple and Google wallet on your phone. Super cool company. Hmm. Very cool. Interesting. Nice. So my little shameless plug is just one that um, this year, since we're starting at the beginning of the year, I did not do resolutions. Instead, <laughs> I am doing reflections every day, ah, 10 minutes. Right. Set time in my calendar to do reflections or meditation. Right. I am uh, doing a uh, learn how to meditate in 30 days. I'm on day 12. So we will uh, see how that goes for the for the rest of the time. But it's really about how do I keep my energy during the day? So that's what I like to start my day out with. Cool. So recently I was in a conversation with uh, someone who talks about the, the mind of any of us, but specifically teenagers. And they talk about the ability during the day to offload all of the secondary uh, pieces that you've got that are going on in the day, right? And that we don't really have those. And if we have trouble sleeping at night or our, our brain is running, it's because we didn't take the time during the day to offload the noise. Mm -hmm. And whether that's meditation or whatever, it's taking the 15 or 20 minutes to shut everything down and just offload our junk. Otherwise, you're going to offload it at the end of the night and your brain's just going to go ahead and spin. That's a good podcast for itself, on, in and of itself. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, appreciate it. If you like, please subscribe. Uh, please forward to other people if you would. And uh, we will look forward to our next episode of the Big Sale Illuminati. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Big Sale Illuminati podcast. If you like this episode, give us a thumbs up and let us know in the comments. Also, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're listening on. Until our next episode, best wishes on your big sales.